Welcome, everybody. We are so grateful to be with you here. I'm Pastor Jack, my wife, Joyce, and we're honored and blessed. And today we have some special truth we want to share with you. We're going to talk a little bit about how to enlarge your faith. And we're going to take a text out of the book of Revelation, chapter 3, concerning the church at Laodicea that had become lukewarm in their faith. But I want to read this verse to you just, to, just so you can see this. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. This is the promise that he gives to the church that if you go from lukewarm to being on fire for God, I'm going to give you dominion the same way that I received it in my ministry. Now this is powerful because he's talking about the throne of David, which is talking about dominion on this earth, praise God. And so he's telling the church, listen, I know you're wealthy, I know you're blessed, but I'm going to give you more than that. I'm going to give you a supernatural ability to reign in this life if you listen to me and correct your behavior, praise God. And I think it's important that we see this because in the church, we get this idea that it don't get any better than it is right now. And the reality is God wants us to enlarge our faith and dream bigger and believe for bigger. Yeah, God's a big God and He has big plans for us and, and there's a big job to do. And when we get into this, this little comfort zone where, you know, me, myself and I and my little family, you know, we're, we're not enlarging our tent. You know, the prayer of Jabez was, you know, went through the church several years ago and, and I loved that season because uh, it became a popular thing to say and to read, but yet it brought vision to people like, yeah, geez, I, I can step out of this little comfort zone that I'm in. I, I am called to, to do more for God. And, and as you do more for God, He's going to keep pouring into you. If, if you pour out, He's going to pour in and then you're going to get that refreshing. Otherwise, what you put in, it just kind of goes stale, it, you know, because you're not using it. Amen. So get ready now. We're going to get in the Word and because that's where it starts. Faith comes from the Word and then we enlarge our faith. We want you to enlarge your, your vision in your life because God has something great in your life to be blessed with. So join us now as we go right into our service. Uh, this morning, what I want to minister to you a message, it's about enlarging your faith. Now, I don't know about you, but in life, as you start out, there's a lot of mountains you face in your life. And when you first start out, the mountains are not quite as big as they are later on in life. And so if we don't enlarge our faith, we get down the road and we're not able to overcome. And I really believe God wants us to overcome. Amen. In fact, let me say it to you this way. It's kind of like you, you meet your wife or your wife-to-be and you get married and it's just you and her. And all of a sudden one day she comes and says, we're pregnant. And you get a baby coming. And then you look around the house and you realize this house is too small. I got to get a bigger house. And it just goes like that and goes like that. And then you know, they start getting older and you're thinking about graduations. Oh, my goodness, I got to have money to send them to college. And it just, no matter where you're at, it just seems like we have to keep enlarging our faith more and more and more and more the longer we're around. And so this message is designed to help you do that. And in doing that, you're not only going to overcome the mountains, you're going to receive the best that God has for you. Can you say Amen. amen. Hallelujah. Let me pray. Father, we thank you this morning. And Lord, we ask you to bless these people coming and going. Lord, bless the sheep. Bless the sheep. Bless the sheep abundantly. And Father, we give you the praise for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen and amen. Turn to a few people and say, I'm enlarging. <laughs> Hallelujah, Jesus. And uh, before I get into the message, please uh, keep coming to church early. Come to church early. Revival is more than just people getting saved. It's when people in the congregation get so fired up that they want to be there early, and it sends a message to those that come to church who are unsaved. They go, these people are serious about God. In other words, you can get people saved just by being excited about it. And I know their schedule is hard, and I'm not saying if you don't come early, don't come. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying set your clock ahead of time. Come early to the service, amen. Because right now, the early service is beating you out. We're going to have a little competition. Can you say amen? amen? Praise God. All right. Are you ready for the word, everybody? Yep. Okay, turn with me over to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 21. 
and get ready. I'm going to show you this. Now, I wanted to start with this because this is a promise connected to the church at Laodicea that we've been talking about the last three weeks. And it's a promise that's given at the end of it. Now, most theologians all agree that the church of Laodicea is, is the type of the church right before Jesus comes back. And there's a promise that is attached to this church. If they stop being lukewarm, he's going to give them this blessing. Here's what it is. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. And as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now, what's interesting about this when you look at this is you go, Lord, I don't understand. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 6, it says that when you believe on Christ, you were raised up with him and made to sit in heavenly places. But here it's saying that I'm going to sit you on my throne just like I sat on my throne after the resurrection. Why would Jesus say it that way? Because he's talking about a church that is experiencing or what he wants to experience the dominion of Christ at the end of the age right now spiritually we're already seen in heavenly places but is the dominion operating in your life right now on this earth that's the question and I'm gonna make a powerful statement here Jesus is not coming back until the church gets the revelation on the prosperity that God wants to bring it until the church gets the revelation of who we are in Christ, until the church gets the revelation of God's manifold blessings to the church. Uh, Jesus is not coming back. Ephesians 4.13 says this. Paul said, after God gave the, the, the fivefold ministry, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, pastor, teacher, he said this. He said, for the equipping of the saints, until we come to the unity of the, of the faith, until we come to the fullness of the stature of Christ. In other words, the church has to enlarge in this awakening to that level before Jesus comes back. Can you say amen? Now, let me put, say it to you because I've been around quite a while, so I can do this. I remember when Billy Graham started preaching, you must be born again. And all the people from denominations got furious with them. Well, we're saved because we're a Lutheran. We're saved because we're Catholic, whatever. Said, no, you must be born again. It was an awakening. And people realized just joining a church doesn't mean you're saved. You've got to make Jesus the Lord of your life and have this conception that happens spiritually in your life. And you remember that, that awakening? All the thousands and thousands of people that got saved during the Billy Graham's Crusades. Another awakening was during the charismatic movement when people started saying, wait a minute, there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit to the church, a baptism where you can speak in tongues. And you remember the great awakening of the church? I remember going to the church, and we had Catholics come and being filled with the Spirit, Lutherans come and getting filled with the Spirit. I mean, it was wild. Amen? And then during the, uh, the last few movements that we've had was an awakening that God doesn't want you broke. God wants you to prosper. I remember growing up in church, and they gave the idea that if you were wealthy, you were, you were a sinner, that you were doing everything wrong. If you had a lot of money, you need to get it all away. And it was better to be poor, busted, and disgusted and be spiritual than it was to be wealthy. But then we got the revelation from the Word of God that the blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he has no sorrow to it. And the church went crazy with that through the full gospel of businessmen and so forth. Great revival hit the church during that praise time. Well, there's more revival coming, more awakening coming. Because right now in the church, we get a lot of people are still getting divorced. Until the revelation of God's word begins to work in your life, and we start seeing more and more people in the church getting their marriage together, getting better and better and better and better, we've got a ways to go. Amen? Amen. And that's why we've got to be awakened to these truths so that we can begin to change the culture and society. But Jesus is not coming back for a church that's broke. He's not coming back for a church that, that's depressed. He's not coming back to a church that isn't producing fruit. He's coming back for a church that is going to abound with blessings. Can you say amen? amen? And if you're in the church, he's waiting for you to get the revelation of this in the Word. And so I want to do that personally. I believe it's very important. And I think sometimes we forget about this Word that we really have today to, to read. I mean, we read the sermon on, that Peter preached in Acts and spirit pours out and all that and we forget the intensity of actually what really took place when jesus was on that cross the bible says 
that from noon to three o'clock in the afternoon, it, it went dark. And uh, all it says is it went dark. But if you study historians, they'll tell you this. They'll say that either it was an eclipse that lasted three hours, which is su totally supernatural, or Amos the prophet said that when this Jesus was crucified, that the sun would literally go down at 12 in the afternoon. And then it would rise again at 3 in the afternoon. And I don't know if you've read that in Amos, the prophecy concerning that. But that was part of the prophecies, predictions that would happen when Jesus was on that cross. And the historians say this, that when, when it was dark, it was so dark that you could see the stars of the sky. But it said the stars did not sparkle. There was no shine to them. And the moon was a blood moon when that occurred. When Jesus was on that cross. And there was a severe earthquake. Historians said that many of the homes were leveled from the earthquake that happened. And we know that in the temple, the veil was rent from the top to the bottom. This all happened when Jesus died on that cross. Hallelujah. And the tombs were open and people were resurrected from their graves and, and went up and went into the city. That's what everybody saw and experienced. Well, at Pentecost... When Peter gets up there and preaches, he says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he explains, uh, he explains this prophecy that, it, that the Spirit of God would come on all flesh. And so they heard him speak in their own languages, even though they weren't from their countries. And, and then he quotes Joel, and he, and he tells them in that prophecy that the sun would, would turn dark and the moon would turn red. And they had just experienced it. And they all got saved. Can you say amen? But all we got now is his word. And if we don't believe his word, how do we expect to see signs and wonders? People died for this word. People died for the gospel. That we would have the holy scriptures. And we got to grab hold of that and say, whatever the Bible says, we believe it. I don't care what, what our culture says. The word of God is the answer to your problem. It's the answer to heal you. It's the answer to your... Come on, church. Give God praise. It's true. Okay. Turn to a few people and say, that's for you. You're going to enlarge your faith. Come on. Point out and say, that's for you. you. You need to enlarge your faith. Come on, dude. Amen. Point number five. This is powerful. Listen to this statement. Resist what you have no choice in and manage what you have choice in. Now, what I mean by that is this, is resistance. Whenever you're removing mountains in your life and a bigger one appears in your life, the only way you're going to overcome it is if you do what they call in sports as, oh, let me, I wrote this down. Oh, what do they call that? No, it's drafting. That's what it is. Drafting. If you're on a skateboard, drafting is you get down to a certain, certain level and you can go faster. Many of you know what I'm talking about if you've ever went on a water slide. If you're sitting up, you just put, 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 put down. But if you get your back down, get, your, get the resistance off it, you just shoot off. They use it in, in uh, race car driving where a car will be ahead and the other car will get right behind it and so the other car is taking all the wind, and so it's in a place where there's least resistance. And then when it gets around the right corner at the right time, he punches it and whips around it. It's called drafting. We need what I would call spiritual drafting in our lives. Because sometimes you're in the midst of trouble in your life where if you don't draft, the resistance is going to be too great that you're going to collapse and, and fall apart. Let me give you an example Jairus brings, goes to Jesus to heal her and says, Lord, if you lay your hands on her, she'll be well. Jesus says, well, let's go. And then on the way there, some friends come and said, don't bother Master anymore. Your daughter has died. Wow. What did Jesus do? He started drafting. He told the crowd, leave. Because the crowd would affect his faith. More pressure than he needed. Then he told Jairus, he said, be not afraid. Only believe. And then when he got to Jairus' house, there were all these women out there mourning. And he sent them away. Because he, what is he doing? He's drafting. He's getting the pressure off him because he can't raise up Jairus' daughter without Jairus' faith. And so he goes in this room. No, not all these other influences. 
praised and does the miracle. My question to you is this. What is it in your life that you have too much pressure on that is preventing your faith from growing? See, if you can change it, change it. There's a lot of stuff that we have pressure on our lives that we could change if we chose to. But we choose not always to change that and just to live with it. I'll give you an example. Let's say that you're, what's your favorite movie, uh, TV series? They had like uh, American Idol. They had Dance with the Stars. What are some of the other movies that they had? Help me out. Voice. Voice. Okay, let's say Voice is your favorite movie. And you watch it every week. And all of a sudden, you're having problems with your teenagers, and they're rebellious, and uh, you're trying to believe God that will get some sense, trying to drag them to church, whatever. The question is this. Nothing wrong with watching The Voice. But maybe right now, that's too much added pressure in your life. Maybe you need to set it aside and spend that time with your kids to get them on track. See what I mean? It's not the thing is necessarily evil or bad. It's just that we're not willing to let go of it. We want to take on this huge mountain with all this, all this stuff. And sometimes the resistance is just too much and we can't overcome. So you've got to do this spiritual drafting that I'm talking about. Let me show you a verse. 1 Corinthians 6, 12. Look at this verse and you'll see it from this verse. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. What Paul is saying is, listen, uh, there are some things in my life that are okay to do, but are they going to benefit me in my life? There's a time to do things, and there's a time to say, wait a minute, it's more important that I spend time doing this. I know when our kids grew up, uh, when they were smaller, we would spend quality time doing certain things now when they got older and moved out and so forth then things change but you you can't just say this is the way it, I like to live my life period faith can't handle resistance in your life that you had a choice to not go, have that you keep if it didn't matter Jesus would have said crowd stay with us if it didn't matter if the women were mourning for Jairus' daughter, if none of that mattered, he would have just left it there and said, oh, this will be just a bigger miracle. I'll have the crowd with me. They'll be able to tell everybody what happened. And even these mourners will realize that uh, I didn't bring death, but I brought life. But he didn't do it because he couldn't do the miracle without Jairus' faith. What's your resistance level? Are you overworked? Are you overwhelmed? Are you under two-inch pressure? What is it? Maybe, maybe, maybe what you need to do is spend a little bit more time with your family and less time watching your favorite sport. Just a thought. Maybe you need to spend a little bit of time more in prayer and less time talking about everybody's problems. See, the, see, the thing is that if we don't do this, we're not going to have this enlarged faith. When I'm doing a sermon and I'm about ready to preach, and I'm in the foyer, and you catch me, whatever, don't tell me your problems. I don't want to hear them. I'll listen to them after the sermon, but not before the sermon. Why? Because I can't handle it. It gets me distracted. And as to, you know, that's what I do, but what do you do that you get distracted with? Are you shopping far more than you really need to shop? Ladies say, no way, I need to show up a lot. Praise God. Well, maybe that's fine. I'm, all I'm saying, all I'm doing is putting something out there. I'm not saying it's one thing or the other thing. I'm just simply saying that if you're going to overcome in your life, you've got to know when to let loose of certain things and replace them with other things. Now, let me give you a key here. The flesh is one of our biggest hindrances Amen. for our faith to work. God moves on us to give, and our flesh says, no, 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 no. God moves on us to forgive. Ah, I don't want to forgive that way or that much. Or, you know, and and it, the flesh is one of the biggest things. Let me show you how to overcome the flesh just real quickly. Look in Galatians uh, chapter 5, verse 17, and look at this text. 
This is the flesh lust against the spirit and spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Now notice he's talking about doing something good. Not something bad. The flesh purpose is to get you where you don't do the good things you want to do. You sit in the church, man, I do want to serve in church. The flesh don't want you to. And so the flesh will have desires for everything. Sleep in, miss church. Uh, you know, sit around, watch TV, don't be involved. The flesh will always be there. But the way you overcome it is not by stopping the flesh. You don't say, flesh, you're not going to have your way. You can't overcome that way. You overcome by increasing the desire of doing what the Spirit is telling you to do and start doing it. As you're doing it, then you overcome the flesh. You don't overcome the flesh by doing nothing. You don't overcome the flesh by stopping. You overcome the flesh by doing. Amen. Let me give you an example. You're on a river and you're in a little canoe. And, you know, you've been in church, you're kind of carnal, whatever, and, you know, you don't know a lot about the word. And so, you, you know, you're going down this river and you've got your paddle out. You're kind of, you know, you go to church whenever you want to. You pray whenever you feel like it. And, you know, you just kind of you live really carnal life. I'm just assuming you're saved. But I'm just saying you look pretty bad. And so you're going down the river and you're paddling. And you're fulfilling the lust of the flesh. Spirit's saying be involved. Spirit's saying you need to be committed. And you're going down this river. And then, and then you hear a sermon like this and go, all right, I'm just going to stop. I'm not going to keep doing these things that are wrong in my life. And you just stop. You're still going to go over the falls down the river because you're in the current. It don't matter if you stop. There's a current. All you do when you stop is slow down the process. You're still going over the falls. The only way you can change it is say, all right, what is the Lord putting in my heart to do? And then you turn your canoe around and start going up against the current. And as long as you're working what the Lord put in your heart to do, the flesh never dominates you. It's only when you stop doing what the Spirit told you to do is the flesh starts dominating Amen? And so we can all overcome if we would simply apply these principles and realize that if you just stop, it's like going down a dead-end road. Just because you stop doesn't mean you're making any progress. You're still on a dead-end road. you got to get on the, another road, another path. I don't like what I'm doing on the weekend. Then replace it with something that is spiritual, that God is leading you to do and do that, and you won't end up doing what you're doing on the weekend. Amen. Isn't this exciting? Yes. And see, I said all this so that you'll volunteer in the church. <laughs> because that's the key. All, everything we do, whether it's making money, it's all for the church. Sure, you get blessed from it, but it's all for the church. It's all for the work of the ministry. That's why I'm here. If not, when you got saved, you get saved, God took you right up. But he left us here because we had work to do. And so if I wasn't preaching, I'd be serving. If I wasn't preaching, I'd be at least being the friendliest guy in the foyer. People come in, how you doing? Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I'd be praying under my breath for these people that don't know Jesus and just praying for people that just come to the church and I, you know, I, I would just do that. But if you don't have a mission like that, then you come in and you leave and the flesh usually dominates you and, and you're living in, in a life that is too empty. God wants you to have joy. Amen. He wants you to be full. Praise God. Join us at the River on Wednesdays and Sundays for weekly services as well as great programs for kids, youth, and young adults. Visit riveroflifefellowship.org to view our calendar of events. There's something for everyone at the River where family matters.